So here we go. In three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the February 14th, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with the board policy 8311, the chair of the committee In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark and Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. <clears throat> yes, Ms. Causey. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Han. Present. Ms. Mack. Present. Ms. Rowe. Present. Mr. Thomas. You have a quorum, ma'am. Thank you. Quorum being present, we will begin. Ms. Clark, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Boswell McComas. Present. Dr. Zarchin, Dr. Holmes, Dr. Almendor, present. Ms. Ferguson, present. Dr. Perandosi, present. Ms. Schubert, present. Ms. Bailey, present. Mr. Stoll, present. And Ms. Forsman. I know somebody joined us by phone, but I don't know who that is. Have I missed anyone? Could that be Ms. Causey? The, micro the microphone is open. The number uh, ending 3738. If you could identify yourself, please, for the record. This is Pamela Forsman. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, item. OK, so item two, unfinished business. Policy 5100 is before the committee after Ms. Mack asked that the policy be referred back to committee at the board's January 11, 2022 meeting. Um, Ms. Mack did not provide details. Ms. Mack, I ask that you state your concerns with policy 5100. Okay, thank you. Um, my concern is that the term regularly could be used differently. And I understand because I reviewed the education article that we took it right out of the educational article, but I just think it's a weak word and it can mean different things to different people. Perhaps I as a student want to have long weekends and I regularly attend Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but other students regularly attend other days. Um, I don't know if we have any latitude since it is in the education article as regularly, but I did want to raise that concern. And since present? I am new to this, I will defer to the experts. Is staff available to um, answer Ms. Mack's questions? I believe Ms. Ferguson Good is here. Afternoon. Yes, this is Kim Ferguson. Um, so our policies and rules are mirrored after what's in Comar, and Comar does um, indicate regular attendance. I know there was some question around 94% um, and, and as, a, as the attendance standard, um, but currently we are we're um, we include the language that's from Comar in our policies and rules. And then my other question was Maryland's the Maryland State Department of Education um, shows 
total attendance. Um, total absence, absence greater than five days, absence greater than 20 days, and chronic absenteeism, which I believe is defined as 10% of the total number of days in which a student is to attend school. Would we um, update policies to include anything like that? Up, update the policies or the rules to include the, the definition of chronic absenteeism and truancy? Yes. I, I'm not making a motion, I'm just asking a question. That's possible, yes. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, do any committee members have questions on policy 5100? Um, I do. This is Aaron Hager. Go ahead, Ms. Hager, Dr. Hager. Um, I I imagine every LEA in Maryland has an attendance policy, and I saw that there were three referenced in the policy um, uh, review, and one of them was from Harper County that that I noticed um, uh, gave a lot more detail about kind of what would happen if there were more than five absences. And I, I understand that often these are put in our school system in the rule. Um, I'm a big believer that if it's something that's consistent and um, you know, there's a defined uh, way to explain it, then it should be in the policy and not the rule. But I don't know if there's a staff member that, that might comment on whether other LEAs have a more, um, more detailed policy with respect to attendance. Um, that's something that I can look into. I don't know every LEA's policy right offhand, so I would have to go back and look at their specific um, policy or rule to see if they specifically address uh, uh, if they go into detail. Well, I guess, so what, what, what made us pick these three LEA's, given that, again, this is a policy that every LEA would have? So I'm looking at the so we we typically look at LEAs that are um, that are around us and are similar in size or close to our district in size. Thank you. I, I'm also new new to the committee, and um, yeah, I, you know, I, I noticed that certain counties tend to have slimmer policies than others, and so I just was kind of curious about what decision making went into that that process. So thank you. Are there any other board members with questions? Yes, Ms. Rowe. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, my question is for Ms. Howie. Is, is there anything in the annotated code or COMAR that would um, prohibit the board from defining regular attendance in there policy? Is, there is nothing that would prohibit um, further definition depending on exactly what's in COMAR and the education article. And just so the, um, the committee is clear, we have a compulsory attendance policy and, a con and an attendance policy. So this policy 5100 that's before you on request of Ms. Mack today, you will be seeing next month an attendance policy. Um, and as Dr. Hager said, every school system, every school board in the state just about has a separate attendance policy. So um, with the committee's indulgence, what I'd like to do, given that your attendance policy is scheduled to be reviewed next month, perhaps then some of your questions can be answered when you're looking at that policy in conjunction with 5100. Thank you. Then I would move to table um, further discussion on policy 5100 and discuss it with the attendance policy and and Ms. Howie perhaps. So it would actually be a motion to postpone. Thank you. To a definite time as opposed to a motion to lay on the table. Sure. Just and lay that on the table is on. the same meeting. Thank you. And which meeting is that on the agenda? It's March 14th. Thank you. I would uh, move I'm sorry. to. Let me. I'm, I, I apologize, Ms. Hen. Uh, let me just make sure I'm correct with the date. Ms. Uh, Clark, could you confirm it's the March 14th meeting? Currently, we're on March 14th, correct. Thank you. 
Thank you, ma'am. Then I would move to postpone discussion on policy 5100 to the March 14th meeting where it can be discussed with the attendance policy. Is there a second, second in the sense? Uh, okay. Second, Mac. Um, being a first and a second, Ms. Clark, can you call the roll, please? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Causey. Excuse me, Chair Rowe, I had put that I had a question on postponing in the chat. I'm sorry, I see that now. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. So if we vote in favor of um, this motion, then I cannot ask my question about policy 5100 or policy 5120. I believe you would have to ask those questions in the next meeting when we do them then, or you could email questions. Okay, thank you. I mean, I am also concerned about this. Um, and well, I guess I'll email you my question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kazi. And any questions that are that are um, emailed, Ms. Howie, is there um, any violation of the Opens Meeting Act with adding the, the emailed questions and answers to the board docs agenda for the next meeting when that's posted? The Open Meetings Act would be violated if you use the email system to basically have a substitute meeting. So if questions are simply sent to staff uh, to answer, that would not be a violation of the act unless you are inviting discussion with other members of the committee. Okay, so I think um, just as a, a general policy, if committee members or even other board members have questions related to the policies that they know are gonna be in future agendas, and those, um, pol those questions are emailed to me, I'll forward to them to staff who can respond in writing and attach them to board docs for the next agenda. Is that satisfactory to everyone? Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's a motion and a second on the floor to postpone um, policy 5100 to the next po policy review committee meeting. Ms. Are there any other questions regarding this motion? Hearing none, Ms. Clark, will you please call the roll? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now we are moving on to policy 6400 magnet programs. Uh, Dr. Boswell McComas, uh, please proceed. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Ms. Rowe, members of the committee. I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Almendorf and Ms. Schubert. Um, as you may recall, we were here at, at uh, PRC, um, I think um, a few meetings back, um, and we've received some feedback, and so we've gone back. Uh, to make some adjustments. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Elmendorf and Ms. Schubert, who will um, share with you the updates that we have amended. Thank you, Dr. Boswell McComas. Yes, we were here on uh, December 13th, and today, like Dr. Boswell McComas said, we are coming back to share the revisions we made to the policy based on the feedback that was shared at that meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me, so policy 6400 is scheduled to be re re reviewed this year. The last revision was in July of 2015. Policy 6400 outlines the board's commitment to providing educational choices through magnet programs. The COMPASS and the BCPS teaching and learning framework hold the core belief that instruction must be accessible for all students. The revisions to policy 6400 support accessible instruction that promotes equity for students and their learning irrespective of student backgrounds and abilities and disrupts disproportionate outcomes. Ms. Schubert will now share the policy changes that are being recommended. Ms. Schubert. 
Thank you, Dr. Elmendorf, and thank you, committee members. So the proposed um, additional policy changes being shared with the committee this afternoon identify that the superintendent will determine how students apply to, are selected for, and enroll in and qualify for magnet programs. In addition, the policy addresses the further promotion of equity and is aligned to BCBS's core values in the equitable geographic access of magnet programs and the alignment of magnet themes within feeder patterns to the degree allowable by funding and logistics. The enactment of this policy allows BCPS to move forward with the magnet processes in an equitable manner. Finally, uh, an addition is that the superintendent will provide the Board of Education with an annual report on adherence to this rule as requested by these committee members. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding this um, policy revision for from committee members? Yes, Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. I um, I swear these are the only two policies I have a bunch of questions about. Just the first two. I'm not going to do this all day. Um, so the the magnet um, policy as a parent who's you know in the midst of, of, of kind of understanding this world of magnet programs in Baltimore County. Um, I understand that it's again another policy that's heavily weighted on the rule. And so it's the, the gist of the policy is that the superintendent will make a, a decision about how this just how this um, this will happen. A, a, am I correct that that's kind of the big picture? And I I have some general concerns about about whether that will by making it in, in the rule and not the policy that then that allows flexibility for um, being modified over time. And so I. I would have liked to have seen the um, kind of the, the plan for guidelines for application qualification selection and enrollment in the policy and not the rule. So I don't know if if there is is there a plan to change this in Baltimore County? Is is that is, or has it been the same way for a long time? I mean, these these are kind of big big decisions that impact a lot of kids. And I just wanted to kind of get get an idea of why why we're relying so much on the rule with this policy if we have a, a plan in place that we've been using. So Ms. Howie, would you um, explain for the benefit of those watching and the new members of the committee the difference between policy and rules and the board policy making authority versus operations and why we don't edit rules? So thank you, Ms. Rowe, and I was actually going to use um, going to discuss that when I discuss the 8000 series as your internal board policies. But the the policies of the Board of Education are basically the vision that the board sets for the school system, whereas the rules are how the system is going to enact the board's vision. So the, the board as the board of the Board of Education as our board of director directors tells us the direction you would like the school system to take and the school and it is the superintendent who decides which road we're going to take to get there. So that's why the rules are more specific than the policies. And as you intimated, Dr. Hager, the rules are much uh, more nimble as opposed to the policies. As you can see from uh, some of the, the background you've been given, uh, we looked at approximately 47 policies last year, which was a high number. We usually review, or the board usually reviews around in the 30s. So if there are changes that need to be made, it's much harder to make them to a policy than to a rule. And that is another reason, a strategic reason, that more detail is placed in a superintendent's rule than in the board policy. Um, thank you, and, and I certainly understand the difference between the rules and the policies. Um, the way I've always thought about these types of educational policies is that if, if a specific practice has been in place for a very long time, then, then integrating it into policy means that it'll have legs to stand on. And so that was just kind of my my thought with um, with something like this that I recall a few years ago, and this didn't impact me personally, but just hearing hearing a lot of uh, um, you know, people talking about the, the changes that were made to poly, to to magnet program acceptance, um, which I again I have no specific opinion on, but but my point was that those changes can be very 
um, you know, cause a lot of commotion for, for kids who are on a specific trajectory. And so having whatever whatever the, the decision is for the school system in the policy would, would again give it kind of stronger legs to stand on than letting it be able to be changed every few years. So again, I, I don't mean to, to keep going on and on, but this was just, mm -hmm. I thought, a good example of one of those situations where um, the language from the rule, if that is what we believe meets this vision, why not put it in the policy? So that's all, I, thank you. I think the short answer to that is because if it gets to directing the superintendent's operations, then it's, not appropriate for the board. I, I again, I meant I meant the, whatever the superintendent's rule is. If it has been in place for a very long time, then then integrating it into the board's policy would be a, a marriage of of policy and practice that would give it stronger legs. But again, I just it was just a I thought a good example of kind of helping to understand that this uh, this process. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Kazi, you put that you have questions. Yes, thank you. Um, in line with um, some previous questions that I'm just toggling back from the superintendent's rule, is um, the reporting standard. Um, so on page one, paragraph 2A, the superintendent will create guidelines for the application qualification selection and enrollment of students in magnet programs. Um, and then the superintendent will, to the degree funding and logistics allow, provide magnet programs equitably in all areas of the county and align magnet program themes within feeder patterns. Um, but then we get to the reporting and it says, the superintendent shall provide an annual report to the board on magnet programs. Uh, but it doesn't have any, in terms of the board's oversight, it doesn't have any indication on what that report would include. Um, so for instance, should it include changes proposed to the current um, superintendent's rule, the, um, the feeder patterns as they are, any proposed changes to feeder patterns, so that in effect, in effect that report is, does provide the oversight, uh, for instance, what other board members are talking about, um, but it makes it specific what the board is interested in. We're interested in um, the guidelines because that's a program of education so the board does have purview there we're not going to make them up but we want to understand if there's any changes what's the rationale um, and then in understanding how programs are distributed around the county and how does that fulfill the board's um, focus on equity Ms. Mack, you had questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I understand the discussion that's taken place so far, but within the policy, there is a statement under, um, what's well, it's letter, part one, letter D, uh, line 28, the board's power the final authority to designate or remove a school as a magnet school rest with the board. So the conversation thus far and the changes to the policy look like um, that the superintendent will make all the major decisions, but yet with item D, the superintendent could make decisions and it looks to me like the board would have the power to rescind any decisions that the superintendent made. And I, I just want to understand that. I don't think so, that's really how it's meant. So when when a new magnet program is started, um, often that comes to the board as if it were a new school or it's a whole thing. And so other times schools have had their magnet programs discontinued and so I think what that states is in the event that the school system recommends that a program be completely discontinued or that a new program be started, that the board has to approve those decisions. I don't think that it means that every single decision that the 
superintendent makes, the board would have say on. But if the superintendent has rules and things that are outlined in rules, the board does hear appeals um, to decide if the school system followed its own policies and rules in regard to magnet applications, and we've seen those. So, uh, Ms. Mack, if I may, uh, the language that you quoted, um, lines 28 and 29, uh, that is current language. Language that is new is in all caps. Language that is being removed is bracketed. And language that is in regular case is language that currently exists. So the staff is not uh, recommending that the board's authority to establish schools, which is part of the education article, be changed in any way or be that be reflected differently in this policy. Thank you, Ms. Howie. I understand that. I guess my question is more general than that in that there are a lot of changes being recommended that again provide the, the superintendent with the ability to make changes and control funding and things like that but yet that statement remains there that the final authority does remain with the board i, I just was it just seems like a dichotomy to me that's all Are there any other board members who have questions before I ask mine? I have one, Ms. Rowe. Go ahead, Ms. Han. Thank you. Um, this is along the same vein as Ms. Mack's question, I believe. There, there seem to be, seems to be a disconnect um, between the funding of the magnet programs and the role of the board versus the superintendent. Um, and I'm looking at 1D and 2B. There is one clause um, that speaks to the superintendent providing the magnet programs to the degree funding and logistics allow. However, it's it's generally the board's responsibility through the budget to provide funding for the magnet programs, um, which speaks to 1D in designating or removing a school as a magnet school. However, the funding it's unclear where the responsibility for funding rests. And although we rely on our funding partners, that that request relies with the board for the appropriation for magnet program funding. So I believe there's an opportunity to um, improve this policy for clarity around that and and to clarify the roles and responsibilities here because I agree with Ms. Mack, it's it's not exactly clear. And for me, the the issue I have with this is around funding. I believe Ms. Uh, Dr. Boswell McComas can answer, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you, Ms. Hen, um, for um, the the point and the discussion. So I think one of the distinctions here is um, section one subparagraph D where it talks about the final authority that really gets back to as Miss Hallie said earlier the the what or the vision right so um, whereas uh, paragraph two subsection B really gets at that sort of how um, and so I think to your point around the budget um, B really gets at of course the superintendent would be working within what the budget is uh, for the magnet program to operationalize um, the vision around magnet programs being equitably um, accessible across the school system. I will invite my team if they have anything they want to add to that, but I think getting back to that point, uh, just to clarify, D really gets at that final authority of what that a, a magnet program does exist or um, ceases to exist, whereas B is really operationalizing the vision of equitable access within the degree of the funding that's available. And I certainly understand this, Hen, because the board has policy and has budget, right? So they're your two strategic levers. So uh, yeah, but again, I, I'll invite I, my team to add. Go ahead, Dr. Alman. Dr. McComas, I wonder if it would be a good idea if Ms. Schubert could share with us. We see in D that it talks about magnet schools and in 2B um, it talks about magnet programs. So maybe differentiating between the two, perhaps? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Alman. Yes, so in, um, in 1D, um, the final authority does remain with our board to, as Ms. Um, 
Rowe uh, shared to close a magnet school or uh, start a new magnet school. In 2B, when we talk about the superintendent's role with magnet programs, um, understand that sometimes a new magnet school in 1D would include a new program, but sometimes we're adding programs to an existing magnet school. So that um, isn't necessarily opening a new magnet school, but, um, and I'll give uh, the most recent example, when BCBS was awarded the Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant, we added six new magnet programs, but only five new magnet schools because Oberlin High School already had a magnet program. So again, I think the language um, in 1D being school and 2B being program is um, a distinct difference as well. Hey, Ms. Cosby, I believe you had an additional comment. Thank you, Chair Rao. Um, I appreciate the conversation and I think um, what would be helpful is connecting the board's role uh, with the superintendent's role, which is uh, the superintendent bringing forward recommendations for magnet programs and magnet schools and updates to the guidelines to the board and then it makes it clear what the process is for the board to um, to review those recommendations and then provide the final authority to add programs add schools or remove programs or remove schools um, as a superintendent has recommended so I'm wondering what the other committee members and or Ms. Howie think about <clears throat> perhaps a clarifying statement in um, paragraph 1D. Ms. Howie. Um, I'm looking at the language. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Rowe. I believe that that language it is somewhat problematic that it designates to remove a school as a magnet school because we do have magnet programs within schools and the schools themselves are not magnet programs. We have whole school magnet schools that the entire school is a magnet school. And then we have magnet schools that are whole school magnets, but some of the population is there by virtue of a zone and some of the population is there by virtue of the lottery process. And so I think that D needs to be clarified. Does the board have the authority to, is it just for opening and closing or redesignating schools, or is it with the establishment or cessation of all magnet programs, or even moving a program from one place to another? So I think that that's the struggle with that clause is the fact that it does not accurately reflect everything that's going on and where the board authority ends and starts. And I'm thinking through um, what is muddy for the committee and please correct me if I'm misunderstanding, uh, but is it the committee's understanding that this language does not give uh, the board the authority to open magnet schools? Well, suppose that the superintendent wanted to open a magnet program in an existing school. Mm -hmm. Is that something that the board would have to approve or not according to this policy? I'm not sure that I'd be able to answer that question just by reading the policy and our policy should be clear enough that a person could answer that question without misunderstanding. And as I understand the policy, if there is a program that is not opening a school, then the superintendent would have that authority. The way it's worded now. Yes, ma'am. OK, are there any board members who wish to make a motion regarded to that section? OK, hearing none. Ms. Rowe, I'm, Ms. Rowe, I'm Go trying to this is Cosie, thank you. I'm um, typing one into the chat. Um, okay. For Ms. Hager, would you like to make your comment while Ms. Cosie is typing? 
Um, sure, just two quick comments. One is I, I agree that having magnet school in only one line of the policy doesn't every other place it's mentioned it says magnet program so there should be some consistency um and just i if this were to uh, come back around which i'm not saying it needs to um i i would like to see other uh other policies besides there's only one policy referenced in the comparison policies and the policy review and it's a very slim policy from Anne Arundel county so just and not again it doesn't need to come back around but in the future just having additional uh reference policies for comparison school systems would be very helpful. OK, Ms. Collins, are you still typing? Uh, yes, so I move to amend policy 6400 page one paragraph 1D. The superintendent will bring to the board recommendations to modify the magnet program regarding designating, adding or removing magnet programs magnet schools and changes to the magnet application guidelines. I don't see that in the chat. Oh, here we go. OK, Ms. Causey stated, I move to amend policy 6400 page one paragraph 1D. The superintendent will bring to the board recommendations to modify the magnet program regarding designating, adding, or removing magnet programs, magnet schools, and changes to the magnet application guidelines. Is, is it your suggestion that that go after the current language? Um, for let me consider that as I state that I am adding for approval by the board okay. to my motion, which is in the chat. Is there a second? Second. I'd, li oh, I'd like to ahead. offer an amendment to Mrs. Causey's motion, and okay. I'll put my amendment in the chat. Okay. Members of the committee, um, in order to understand exactly what you're voting on, I would recommend uh, that when you're uh, processing an amendment, you either state whether or not it's adding, which is to the end, or inserting, which is uh, putting within a sentence or striking out. So uh, my question would simply be whether or not this is adding. So is this going at the end of um, the sentence on line 29? Ms. Causey, what was your intention? My intention is by adding. Thank you. So that line I just want to make sure that everyone understands that line would then read that if we pass this motion, the final authority to designate or remove a school as a magnet school rests with the board. The superintendent will bring to the board recommendations to modify the magnet program regarding designating, adding or removing magnet programs, magnet schools and changes to the magnet application guidelines for approval by the board. Yes, that's my. That's my motion. And Ms. Hen seconded. Is no, Ms. Mac seconded. Ms. Mac seconded. And okay. I'm working on typing an amendment in the chat. I just need another second or two. OK. May I speak to my motion while she does that? Yes. So I think that the. Um, that this would clarify the superintendent and his staff do the work of uh, analyzing, uh, reviewing, uh, putting together the data and then bringing the recommendations. Um, and then the board would review that and approve it. So there was conversation earlier about magnet schools. There's a difference between a magnet school and a magnet program. Uh, but also if there were any dramatic changes to the magnet application guidelines, there's the opportunity and the specificity of when the superintendent would bring that to the board um, so that the board could also evaluate that that is in keeping with the mission and values and policies. So um, members of the committee, in terms of the guidelines, the application guidelines, I would ask um, staff to address 
when those are published and given to schools or published to schools. I just don't know if the the board's current process is um, nimble enough to be able to get that done in an efficient fashion. Right, um, if I may, before my team responds, I just want to say the um, the the changes to the magnet application guidelines does really start to uh, intersect with operations and procedures. So I'll um, allow my team to go ahead and uh, address your question around timeline of that. Certainly the uh, first part of the motion is in, it well within keeping of um, the spirit of Section 1D, um, it clarifying uh, the board's authority related to the um, removal or creation of those magnet programs slash schools, uh, but I'll, I'll have the team uh, uh, comment now. Thank you. OK, Ms. Um, Hi, I can, I can go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not quite sure if we're talking about the rule when we're talking about the magnet application guidelines or we're talking about the information that's provided to the schools. Um, because our the guidelines we provide to the schools are based on the content of the rule, which is modified occasionally um, to align with changes in system language or or other rules um, or practices within our programs. But uh, the guidelines that we provide to the schools um, and to the parents, we publish in our magnet programs brochure. And we also provide public and public information meetings. Um, we begin developing those materials in May and publish them by the end of July. Thank you. Um, Ms. Han had an amendment. Ms. Han, would you read your amendment, please? Sure, thank you. And it's um, wordsmithing primarily. My Amendment is as follows. I move to amend Mrs. Causey's motion by replacing the language as follows. The final authority to designate or remove a school as a magnet school, designate, add, or remove magnet programs, and make changes to the magnet application or admission guidelines rests with the board. Is there a second to that amendment? I'm sorry, before you proceed, uh, Ms. Hen, to amend an amendment, you have to strike out or add to the language that is there. So I, I'm not sure I know what is being added or what is being stricken. That sounds like a new motion. It's replacing the language to make it consist more consistent with the language that's currently in the policy. Thank you, ma'am. So when you look at the language that's on the screen, what are you striking out? I am striking Mrs. Causey's language and replacing it with the language to make it more consistent with the policy as written. It's reordering the, the clauses that Mrs. Causey has written for consistency with the policy as written. And respectfully, that's a new motion. It's not an amendment to this language. Okay, then I will withdraw my amendment then. OK, um, so uh, there were other questions regarding this. I believe Dr. Hager had a question. Um, yes, and it, it kind of gets to what Dr. McComas was saying. I, I feel that the end of this motion about the um, magnet application guidelines um, is contradictory to Section 2A of the policy. They, they don't seem to, to mesh to me, which is concerning. Um, Again, I, I, I wouldn't be opposed to, to a policy that included more, spe more specifics around 2A, but at the same time, I don't think we can have language that, contra that seems to contradict each other. I don't know if that's accurate, uh, Ms. Howie or anyone. So I'm inclined to agree um, in that regard, and I would like to make a motion to strike and changes to the magnet application guidelines. Second. Are, are there any comments on that amendment or questions? May I ask who made the second, please? Ms. Hen. Ms. Hen. Ms. Clark, would you call the roll? 
Ms. Rowe, I put in the chat, I have a question on the amendment. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Causey. Thank you. So, um, I see the rationale for that, um, and I'm not saying that I disagree, but I think that it is important for the board to have a mechanism where um, mag any changes the superintendent intends to make to the magnet application guidelines, magnet application or admission guidelines, um, that they're brought forward to the board as information and then if the board felt that they were not in line with the policy then there would you know be a time to do that what we don't want to have happen is for there to be um, major changes to the magnet application um, or admission guidelines that of which the board is unaware and then we ultimately hear appeals um, and and that may be an issue of what was in the guideline and and um, so for the board to have some mechanism where it is known ahead of time rather than Ms. Causey, could you clarify when you say application guidelines, are you referring to every minutia of the process that's in the rule or are you simply referring to whether or not a school has assessments, lotteries or a combination of assessments and lotteries? Let me look at the rule. Because one, is, one is more broad. Like I understand what staff is saying about the publishing materials, but I think in the past the concern of the public and the board is when a school changes from um, an assessment with a lottery to an entire lottery process. But we see those changes when we get the rule changes as information to the board agenda, to the, the general board meetings. So well, there's that also. I hear what you say, but typically rule changes come to the board after policy changes. So if there has been, so for example, if there has been no policy change, but there is a rule change, but it does not come to us as a point of information. So where is it? So if someone came in new and didn't know anything about anything, how would they know that changes to the rules um, are informed to the board in a timely fashion. How would they know what that process is? And that is information that's provided during the board's orientation, which is one of the policies that is uh, up this evening uh, as to the process. And one of the reasons that the rules um, follow the policies is that we want to make sure as staff that we have the enacted policy from which we are uh, writing or refining the superintendent's rule. OK. Um. Yes, but it's still if, if someone looked at policy and someone looked at rule. It neither seems to indicate that. There. The superintendent has a responsibility to provide the changes in the rules to the board before they're implemented. So Ms. Causey, that's getting just a it's, little outside of the scope of the amendment on the floor. Um, and I'd like to process this amendment. Uh, and I see that Ms. Joes had a question, but I'm not sure if it's in regard to something that we've moved on from. Ms. Joes, was your question related to the amendment or the motion, or is it to the pro policy more broadly? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. It was to the policy more broadly. My concern was that we were going into operations and I think one of the staff members explained that pretty uh, clearly. Um, so I think my question was answered. Okay. And secondly, I do want to point out that that was one of the efficiency reports findings was that this board tends to go into operations a lot and, and policy should be written from a governance point of view and to be on the board for three, four years and not understanding how um, these policies are enacted is not it's. I, I just find that a bit troubling, so thank you. OK, thank you. Um, are there any more questions or comments related to the amendment to strike the language and changes to the magnet application guidelines from the motion? Ms. Rowe. 
It's yes. a minor point, but would you please add the word and before magnet schools to your language? Oh, magnet for so magnet schools. Since you um, struck oh, the I last see. phrase, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, are there any other comments? Ms. Rowe, just looking at the language, should it say modify a magnet program or the magnet programs? Or maybe that's a question for Ms. Howie. The question is whether or not it is comprehensible. If someone reading it doesn't understand the authority of the board or the authority um, that the, the superintendent has, then it's not clear and it should be changed accordingly. And obviously it's changed per the board's pleasure. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah that does. Make sense. Magnet programs regarding. I think that um, altering it to say a, a magnet program is more specific and more grammatically correct. But do we have to make that an additional amendment, Ms. Howie? This is a, considered to be a small assembly, so it's less, um, Formal. Less formal. However, if you continue to change, um, it can be done by, you can do it by unanimous consent, ma'am, as the chair. Does, it, does anyone object to inserting the words a magnet program as opposed to magnet programs so that it's clear that it's every individual magnet programs and not only groups of magnet programs? Okay, hearing none, we can add and change that from plural to singular. Okay, um, Ms. Clark, would you please call the roll on the amendment to strike and change or and changes to the magnet application guidelines? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have a few questions about this um, policy more broadly. So one of the things I noticed is that in their standards 2A, it says the superintendent will create guidelines for the application, qualification, selection, and enrollment of students in the magnet programs. Um, I move to insert the words public. So Include Ms. insert the word public in after create. Ms. Rowe, you've not yet um, completely. Oh, I'm sorry. We have to uh, amend it. Okay, sorry. Um, so we need to vote on the motion as amended, which will now read. I move to amend policy 6400 page 1 paragraph 1D by adding the following after the word board in line 29. The superintendent will bring to the board recommendations to modify the magnet program regarding designating, adding, or removing a magnet program and magnet schools for approval by the board. Ms. Clark, will you call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, so what I was saying is in um, section 234, I would like to insert the word public after create because it's important that the guidelines for the application, qualification, selection, enrollment, that those guidelines be entirely transparent to the public and published. And I think inserting the word public after create um, communicates the board's expectation that these not be something that's internally known, but is not known to the public. How does the committee feel about that? Ms. Rowe, this is Ms. Hen. Yes. 
Um, would you be open to substituting the word publish by replacing the word create? The superintendent will publish guidelines. Yes, I think we could do that. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. It meets the purpose. So um, instead of inserting, substituting the word create with publish, so it would read the superintendent will publish guidelines. Ms. Rowe, is that a motion? I believe we're just having a conversation okay. at the moment. It's how we suggested we could do this by unanimous consent, so I think that's a faster way of accomplishing this. So do any committee members have any comments on striking the word create and replacing it with the word publish so that that section would read the superintendent will publish guidelines for the application, qualification, selection, and enrollment of students in magnet programs? Okay, hearing none, that edit is approved. Um, the other concern I had that I'd like to discuss with the committee is Section C, the board's vision, has a lot of equity language that is not as precise as our equity policy. And I'm concerned that having equity language in a policy that does not exactly match our equity policy could become confusing, particularly in the situation where we have the word inclusion for an application process that necessarily excludes some people because we do not have the space for everyone and the equity policy does not have a definition for inclusion and so I would like to strike all of that language and replace it with some sort of language that simply references the board's expectation that the equity policy be reviewed or referenced to when creating magnet policies. And I wondered if Ms. Howie could recommend how that language might work. So members of the committee, uh, just so you're aware, I believe you have seven board members present. Which means what precisely? Which means this is an unannounced board meeting. Ms. Howie, does that mean someone has to leave? Yes, ma'am. I'm afraid given the size of this committee, you're unable to have guest board members unless uh, the the meeting is announced as a board meeting. OK, so the Ms. Guest Rowe, Mr. Thomas joined and you might not realize that. Yeah, Mr. Thanks. Thomas is on this committee, though, so I believe Thank the you. board member that's in attendance who is not on this committee would be Ms. Joe's. And yeah, Ms. I Jones, would. Ms. Ms. Joe's has left the meeting. Sorry, I'm speaking. She has left the meeting. Yeah. OK, so. We only have committee members now, Ms. Howie, is that correct? OK, thank you for noticing that. Um, so Ms. Howie, could you speak to how we might accomplish the goal of simply referencing the equity policy? Because when we have language that is equity inclusion language and it's not the same language that's in the equity policy, my confusion, the, the, the problem here is, well, what creates what has more precedence, the equity and inclusion language in the magnet policy or the equity inclusion language in the equity policy that covers the entire school system? And I think that I understand why equity language, um, why the committee wanted equity language to be there, but I have a problem with the fact that the equity language is not the exact same as the equity language that's in the equity policy and includes words for which there are no definitions. So what is the committee's pleasure? Committee, do you have, does anyone have comments or discussion on this? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, so the superintendent will, to the degree funding and logistics allow, provide magnet programs equitably in all areas of the county and align magnet program themes within feeder patterns. I just wanted to read that again. No, um, we're looking at C. We're looking at 1C. Oh, the board's educational equity and inclusion must play a vital and integral role in the selection, application, and assessment process, and these principles will guide every aspect of the magnet process. Raising achievement for all students and closing achievement gaps remains a top board priority. Right. I, I don't have any problems with that language at all. I think it, it states very clearly educational equity and inclusion. 
must play a vital and integral role in the selection of, of, of students to participate in magnet programs. Um, in fact, uh, uh, on this matter, I know we're on C right now, but on B, I actually wanted to remove some language that says to the degree funding and logistics allow because I think we should be holding ourselves to that standard of equity at all times and not and, and continuing to try to make our make sure we are at the degree funding that allows that and logistics that, that allow that. Um, I don't have a problem with this language and I, I, I really think it's very clear. Um, I think the definition of equity and inclusion is something that is very clear um, in kind of what, what we're looking towards. Um, so I don't have a, a problem with the language and I, I, I've been reviewing this. Um, I think it's, it's, it's eloquently stated kind of what we want to achieve for our students. Um, maybe we, we, we continue to go further and we, you know, I, we can't go into operations with this. I, I read the superintendent's rules and I think that uh, I, I don't want us to go, you know, I, I think that this yeah. is, it's very I understand. Clear I see, yeah. I think my concern isn't that there's something specifically long, wrong with the language, except that we have an equity policy and we have separate policies for separate things for a reason, and these are legal documents on which people base their legal appeals. And when you have a policy that is referencing another policy, I think it's important to use the exact same language that's in the other policy. And as opposed to muddying a policy, because we could, we, the policies are supposed to be distinct from one another and cover completely separate things. So if we wanted to add an, uh, some sort of equity language specific to magnet programs, it, I think it would be more appropriate to add that equity language in the equity policy specific to magnet programs than to attempt to chop up and take something that isn't a direct quote from the equity policy and put it in another policy. It, it, I think it creates confusion. And particularly also because the equity policy defines every possible equity term that could exist except inclusion. And this is magnet programs are programs that because not all students who apply are, can attend, there is a necessary exclusion. And so without a very clear definition in the equity policy for the word inclusion, this section C, it would be very unclear to know how that would actually be applied or what that actually means as far as the community. So um, what I'd be looking for is a direct quote from the equity policy or to strike it and just reference the equity policy. Um, other board members had comments and I'm not certain who was first to put it in the chat. Um, Ms. Mack. Ms. Murray, no, you, you spoke to what my question was. Thank okay, you. Ms. Penn. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, I think we can um, simplify this to your point, and I do agree. I think consistency with our equity policy is important here. And I think we can simplify this by referencing the board's equity policy and I'd like to move to amend policy 6400 by striking 1C and inserting to section 2 the following language guided by the board's equity policy 0100 prior to 2A. Oh I see so line 33. Yes before the superintendent you want to insert guided by the board's equity policy. Correct. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Causey. Are there any questions or discussions on this motion? Someone just speak if you have a question because okay. I've lost track of the chat. <laughs> yes. Mr. I, Thomas. I'm wondering, so for the members who, who created this policy, um, sorry, I wasn't at the only at the beginning to see who presented this, but thank you for presenting this. Um, do you think that that would suffice kind of what, when we have the board's vision and we listed out the board's vision in uh, 1C, do you think by just referencing equity, the equity policy that we are, we are capturing the same kind of goal as referencing the board's vision? Because if that's the case um, from, the, from the authors of, of this change in the policy, then I, I'm in full support of this. Ms. Rowe, may I respond? Yes, Ms. Hen. 
Thank you. I believe that the equity. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, for that question. I, I believe that our it's important that our equity policy um, be consistently revisited and that it evolve and that all of our policies um, incorporate that policy and that rather than um, having the need to revisit, I know that we won't revisit every single policy every time that we need to revisit our equity policy. So I would rather reference it and refer um, everyone back to our equity policy so that it is always kept current and would rather see us reference it so that we are referring back to the most current version of our equity policy then have outdated language that is not the most robust and most current version of what we um, we contain within our equity policy the the latest and greatest at the time so i i do believe we should reference um, the latest and greatest policy rather than language that as ms rose said may be outdated and is outdated thank you ms cause you had a question Yes, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the discussion of board members. Um, I wanted to point out two things. One, the equity policy was, our equity policy was developed in um, involving the work of the Maryland Association of Boards of Education and a special committee that they had um, working on this along with MSDE and I believe the work was um, almost two years. So there was a lot of tremendous input and thought and um, wordsmithing and really a statewide effort. Um, and so with Ms. Hen's point, I think that's a that's a great point to reference it. Also, I was just going to suggest that it might uh, be muddy in the waters if we say inclusion when uh, many times that's a very specific has specific meaning for special education um, students or programs. And so I think as Ms. Hen pointed out, this is um, very clear and also will be updated as the board feels that policy needs to be updated. So thank you. Thank you. OK, seeing no further questions. Ms. Clark, would you call the roll on the motion to strike section C and insert line 33 guided by the board's equity policy 0100 prior to the words, the superintendent will. Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Thank you. OK, now Mr. Thomas, you had a, a question or a statement about um, B the superintendent yes. will to the degree funding and logistics allow provide magnet programs equitably in all areas of the county and align magnet programs and themes within feeder patterns. Yes, thank you. Um, I move to strike to the degree funding and logistics allow from lines 37 to 38 of, of page one. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Are there comments or questions regarding the motion? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I, I kind of said this earlier. I just feel like um, by adding to the degree funding and logistics allow, I think that's already kind of implied and, and as we're moving towards that more equitable system, that more inclusive system. And I just feel like it not to say that this will happen, but you know, there's changes in Board of Education, there's changes in, super, in superintendents, but I feel like this could be used as like, well, we don't have the funding, so we're not going to advocate for an increased magnet programs one day. When I think we should always be advocating for increased magnet programs, we should always be moving towards creating logistics to allow that. So I think that if we say the superintendent will provide magnet programs equitably in all areas of the county and align magnet program themes within feeder patterns and remove that, it, it, pardon me, in, in, in the to degree of funding and logistics allow, we'll assert that the board is taking a stance that we want to have an equitable magnet system. I think. If we if we put to the degree of funding and logistics allow, you know, we can kind of be be diluting uh, what we really want to see and, and settling for something less. So that's quite why I believe that we should remove that. I have a question for Ms. Howie about that. Yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Howie, if we were to remove that language, would we in any way be opening the school system up to lawsuits in such a way that if there were not funding and if we could not equitably supply magnet programs all over the county, could we be sued in such a way that 
it would become a situation of either we have zero magnet programs or we pony up the funding to have magnet programs everywhere. I believe there was a, re a legal reason that was originally put there and I can't recall and I'm hoping you do. What I recall is that that was uh, that language was crafted at the request of the committee. OK, so there was not a legal specific reason. Other than that is what the committee specifically requested at the last board meeting or last committee meeting. OK. Right. Are there any other board members? Ms. Hen, you had a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, so thank you, Mr. Thomas. I, I support this motion wholeheartedly. I, I think um, there's additional opportunity to improve upon it further. Um, we we discussed this prior to you joining the, the call today and that I believe it's the board's responsibility to ask for what we need in terms of funding. And I think that's a gap that we need to address in this policy because ultimately it's the board that approves the budget request that goes to the county executive. So should we need additional funding to provide for um, magnet programs equitably countywide? It's the board that needs to ask for it. So and it is the superintendent's responsibility to um, handle the logistics and I think that's where the responsibilities are divided. So I think there's opportunity to clarify it. So I will be supporting your motion to strike that language. I do believe um, we should add language and I'll I'll work on on that motion separately, but I will be supporting this. Um, but I do think the board needs to commit to asking for what we need in terms of um, asking for that funding to accomplish this. And I think that belongs in policy and we need to clarify that the superintendent's role is the operations. So thank you for making this motion. OK, seeing no further um, comments or questions, Ms. Clark, would you take the roll, please? Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. OK, is there any further discussion on this policy? I have a comment. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Uh, I move to insert in order to provide every student equal opportunity to pursue the program to line 35 of this policy on page one. Where in that line? Where are you trying to add that? Prior at the end. To yeah, at the end of the sentence. So after of students and magnet programs, comma, in order to provide every student an equal opportunity to pursue the program. So all right, so that would read as amended. The superintendent will publish guidelines for the application, qualification, selection, and enrollment of students in magnet programs. And then your statement is. I don't have it in chat, so I can't read oh, it. It's in chat. It's in it's in black in order to provide every student an equal opportunity to pursue the program. Is there a second? Hearing them I have a, Ms. Rowe, I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm I support this, but I'm wondering okay. if it is not redundant given the um, clause that we're adding just before 2A, which references the equity policy. The equity policy does outline opportunity and etc. Mr. Uh, Tom. If there's no second to the motion, so I don't know if I can speak to it, but if someone could second you can, it. You can speak yeah. to it. We're, okay. This is, OK, thank we, you. We've already muddied up the parliamentary procedure <laughs> this entire meeting, and Ms. Howie says it's a small gathering, so okay. go ahead and say what you need to say. But we do need to move on to other party policies because we are very behind schedule, and I don't want to be here all night. OK, thank you. Um, so quick. So right now we know that I, ca I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but a certain amount of students who are the top test scorers automatically have the opportunity to get or top test scores, top points overall for their magnet tests and score system, have the opportunity to get first treatment or first selection uh, to the magnet program. And I find that to be inequitable. I, I personally find that to be kind of in violation of our policy. It provides, it, it, it doesn't give equal opportunity for all students who be the benchmark to, to succeed if we then have a lottery system after that. So I think by adding this language, we make it very specific that every student would have an equal opportunity to pursue the program, and that would in turn uh, re require a revision in the superintendent's rules 
um, for, for that. So that, that's my reasoning for, for making this motion. I wouldn't have a discussion on that um, just because, you know, we can't go into the nitty gritty details of operations, but I think this would require a revision of those operations. So I would ask uh, Mr. Almendorf or Dr. Boswell McComas uh, if you could uh, address Mr. Thomas's concerns, please. Dr. Elmendorf, you can go ahead. Um, I do wonder about the operational implications of um, including this language. We're talking specifically about line 35. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit more about what the end um, goal is or what the, you know, what the goal is for this change? Yeah, I can. So the goal would be to, uh, in, in my mind, this is what I would envision this doing, would require the operations. It would um, require revision of the superintendent's rules to get rid of the, the ability for students who, you know, score, the top score is to automatically have preferred admission into the magnet program in comparison to students who, for, who, are, who are in the lottery system. So in my mind, this would move us completely to the lottery system and not have uh, not have the, the preferred admission for the students that have um, the, the top scores. Yeah, and, and I know we talked about this a little bit in December. And we talked about the disruptive implications of um, moving that far this quickly. And I don't know, Mr. Schubert, you have a little bit better understanding, Mr. Stoll, of the historical precedent that's been set with, with testing in the high school level. I, um, I do. So, Mr. Thomas, I do want to clarify, you're, you're not implying shifting complete the lottery, but you're sh implying removing the 20% the clause in the admit. Okay, oh. <laughs> just wanted to make sure I understood. Yes, yeah, so we did discuss this a little bit in December, um, and, um, you know, I will share with you, this was a... Um, a great point of conversation with our stakeholders when we did um, focus groups several years ago. Um, and while I can say that on a personal level, I agree with you and many folks may agree with you, the majority of our stakeholders felt firmly that that 20% clause in the admission process was a practice they wished for BCBS to continue. Ms. Schubert, when you all discussed this, did you discuss whether or not the more recently um, past equity policy is consistent with allowing the top 20% of scores to have automatic admissions, considering that there are an even larger number of students who meet all of the baseline requirements? Was, was that, was, did that discussion happen? Uh, so I will tell you, I didn't conduct any of those focus groups, so I can't um, I can't confirm if the equity policy was, was a part of that discussion, Ms. Rao. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Rao, I think the question is whether or not having the 20% uh, violates any sort of equitable principle. And um, I see that Dr. McComas is on as well and can speak to the study that was done uh, of our magnet programs and our magnet schools a few years back, uh, we did have an audit done of the process that the system uses. So, but as I've said, and as the new members of the committee will get used to hearing me say, this is your policy. Uh, this belongs to you. We simply support the board to make sure that the work gets done, but ultimately it's your policy, your vision, your goals. So if this is what the board desires, it's your policy. Dr. Boswell McCombs. I, I would just uh, like to add that um, thank you for unpacking your intention around the, the language here. Uh, that would have significant operational impact um, on our practices. And so I know that um, it's, it's always a challenge to walk that line between um, governance and operations. Um, and so I just, uh, caution that that um, understanding your intent and the language there has significant operational impact uh, for our current practices, which um, I think I would be remiss if I just I wasn't really clear about that. So thank you. Are there any other committee members who have comments on this motion? Um, Dr. This is, Hager? Yeah, thank you. Um, I I don't love the idea of starting the statement with an 
citing the equity policy and ending with equality. Those two things kind of don't mesh in my head, they, the, the way that that would be written. Um, and I um, have very mixed feelings about it going to a full lottery, which I feel like could be the implication of adding this statement, particularly for the arts programs. Um, and so I, I, I do not support this addition. Okay, Ms. Clark, seeing no further comments, will you call the roll? I did not have a second on that motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a second on this motion? You don't need a second. It's been discussed at length. Uh, got it. Okay, that we is called. Considered to be a second. We okay, called, Ms. Please. Ms. Causey? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Han? No. Ms. Mack? Abstain. Ms. Rowe? No. Motion does not carry. Okay, um, committee members, do I have a motion in regard to this policy as a Ms. whole? I'm sorry. I didn't vote. Oh, Ms. Mr. Thomas. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm still getting used to hearing everyone's names in the order. Um, committee members, do I have a motion to move this uh, policy to the full board? So moved. Hen. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. second, second, Thomas. OK, um, is there discussion on moving this policy to the full board? Mr. Ms. Ms. this is Ms. Causey. Yes, I put in the chat. I had a question. So the previous discussion. Um, um, gives me a thought and I'm not going to address it here, but I would ask uh, for the committee to consider this as a after this motion is taken. Uh, to ask for some other language to be uh, inserted before it comes to the board around the superintendent bringing, um, you know, providing updated guidelines to the board in a timely fashion. Because from the way our policy reads, there is not specificity around uh, percentages that have the um, highest scores. Um, and, but we understand that that's how we do it. And so that there should be an opportunity, a timely opportunity for the board to review any uh, changes to those superintendents rule and the guidelines. So Ms. Kazi, we actually did already debate this when we were discussing um, the earlier revision and there is a reporting requirement and we do receive the rule. So uh, as we have the roll call, we're about to do the roll call. I'd like to move this forward to the full board and continue that roll call. And then if you have further language that you want to suggest when it's before the full board, I think that would be the appropriate time to do that. OK, thank you. All right, Ms. Clark, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Thank you. Uh, the motion carries. And so we. So, uh, members of the committee, we are quite um, a bit behind, and there are several staff members who are on the call um, who are here for policy 6402 special education services. And as you can imagine, that is uh, quite a weighty policy. So I would ask the committee's indulgence that uh, policy 6402 go forward uh, and that the three policies that are there for unfinished business, I can present after staff have finished. And I would also ask whether Dr. Elmendorf, uh, Ms. Schubert and Mr. Stoll can be excused. Um, Yes, to all of that, unless there are any objections. Are there any objections? Hearing none, Ms. Howie, we proceed. Thank you. So uh, policy 6402, Special Education Services. Yes, so um, good evening. Um, again, um, this policy is really uh, coming forward as part of the um, cycle of policies for review. At this point, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Pierandosi and uh, Ms. Bailey uh, to present uh, um, our updates. Thank you. 
Good evening, committee members, committee chair and committee members and our colleagues. Policy 64 comes today with the proposals for revisions in the areas of our board's commitment, mission and vision, as well as in alignment with our federal and state regulations. Our policy begins or necessitates providing access to our students with IEPs in the in the varying learning environments and in an effort to provide that the provision of a free and appropriate public education or FAPE. This policy supports our strategic plan, the COMPASS, as it assures a full continuum of services to appropriately differentiate instruction and provide support to our students with IEPs receiving access of services as well as student achievement, supporting student achievement based on their identified needs. Policy 6402 supports the board's commitment, mission and vision to the principle that every student can learn and succeed. It also provides an assist in the areas of nurturing the student potential and enhancing academic success. Finally, as well as it aligns with our board's vision for that students with IEPs receive the educational benefits of the identified supports, services, modifications and accommodations to address their individual needs. And finally, with our policy 6402, so it supports both the implementation of necessary services for students with IEPs and meets all federal and state regulations outlined in IDEA or the Individual with Disabilities Act and our COMAR provisions of services. With that, we thank you for the opportunity to bring this policy forward and submit um, for its current amendments or revisions. Thank you. Board members, is there discussion on this policy? Um, this is Erin Hager, I have a very brief question. Um, I saw that the policy only addresses students with IEPs and I was having trouble finding, I looked through the rule as well and 504 plans are not mentioned and, and you know, my not knowing as much about this process, I, I always think of them, you know, as, as kind of uh, two tools that we often use. Um, is there a separate policy that addresses 504 plans? Um, 504 does not fall under special education in BCPS and this is a special education policy, but yes, 504, um, as well as I saw um, the magnet or gifted provisions, they fall under a separate policy or, or procedures. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion from committee members? I would like to say something. Um, one of the things that I don't see in this policy that I would like to see in this policy is a requirement for the school system to publish a document which informs and educates parents on their special education rights and that is a step-by-step -step manual of how they can access those rights so that when you have someone who is in kindergarten or first grade and they're a new parent to the school system they have a comprehensive document that gives them all of their rights for special education so that if they want to ask for an assessment to determine eligibility for special education services, they can be handed this document because what I encounter frequently in the community is that parents say special education and someone says, well, we're not gonna do an IEP meeting and they have no idea that they have the legal right to ask for it in writing and then it must be done. And so I, I would like to know what the committee thinks about requiring in the policy that the superintendent publish a manual of special education rights and specifically how to access those rights within the school system. Committee members. I'm sorry, Dr. Pirandozzi, could you please explain um, the due process rights that are um, announced and published for parents. Absolutely, thank you very much for um, bringing in the procedural safeguards. It is referred to as the procedural safeguards. Every parent receives them and they receive them annually with every annual review of their IEP or the student's current IEP. That is required by law 
to obtain, to receive or review not only the procedural safeguards, but explain them to the parents as well as provide them a, a hard copy. We have those accessed on our website or accessible on our website. And in addition to the, not only that, but that does um, go into detail as for any dispute resolution, informal or form formally, the process that they, a parent may access when in need. So that is one avenue or one venue in which families are informed, made aware, informed, and done so annually reminded during that annual review. In addition, I'd like to say you are on track with um, our thinking and a provision to provide all families, not only families, but our current staff, leadership, the board, um, students and families, everyone can access. We are creating a comprehensive policies and procedurals document for special education. This will encompass not only the federal, state, definitions and requirements in COMAR as well as IDEA, but also BCPS processes and procedures. It will include eligibilities, identification processes, assessments, dispute resolution as you're talking about, and parents will be able to access that as well. It will be a forward-facing document to families, but also used as a training um, material or a training document for all of our staff as they come into and support students with special needs. Okay, so yeah, I understand all the documents that are provided at an IEP meeting. My main concern was parents who are newly accessing the school system or have some reason to believe their child has a need, right. but they have no idea where to obtain that document. And if you're creating that, that's wonderful. Um, I do wonder though if that document that you all are creating to be available to the public and sort of an initiation or all encompassing thing should be articulated as a requirement in policy. Does staff have an objection to requiring it in policy? I mean, you're already doing it. Right, I, I think we're doing, I think the, the issue is just, you know, um, operations. We, we always would need, yeah, operations, right? Like where's that, that <laughs> line of when we need to just provide uh, an update to the um, manual or the procedures. Um, but again, our goal is to have things forward facing and available um, so that things are transparent. So I think that's that's just that fine line there. Ms. Okay, Rowe. Ms. Tazi, you had a question? Thank you. I appreciate the presentation and the discussion. In the public works uh, efficiency and performance review, there were a number of um, um, addressing the special education program. There were commendations in there um, as well as recommendations. And so uh, two of the commendations, 8-25 and 8-26, um, I'm wondering how those would be because it doesn't seem to, the policy doesn't seem to address any of that, which is um, significant, which is um, the BCPS and Department of Special Education have a systemic compliance issue that has a needs intervention status by the Maryland State Department of Education, um, numerous issues around complaints, so forth. Um, so it is recommended that the Department of Special Education design a compliant infrastructure to serve students with specialized needs within the BCPS system. So that doesn't seem to be addressed in the policy and in terms of an overarching um, mission. And then the next uh, significant one relates to um, what Ms. Rowe was referencing, which is the suggestion to have specific instructional and student services manual. So do we have a manual for admissions and placement in special education programs that's available on the website? So if I may, Dr. McComas, before you, I know you would like to address the um, constructs, but as far as the manual is concerned, there has been a manual and that is just it. It is limited to more of a handbook than a comprehensive policies and procedures document. 
And so having worked, um, the person that uh, conducted the the recommendations or the the review efficiency review was a bureau chief in the state department of education in florida and so i am very familiar with what she is re referred to as that document and because i had to develop one as as an executive director there so that is kind of the alignment in which we want to follow something that is comprehensive beyond a manual beyond um because a manual would be more for staff. Um, I'm looking to, and we actually have that to move forward and submit to MSDE because it allows for all of the legislative changes that has occurred so that we can update that. If we do so in a policies and procedures document, we can up those that up those though update it frequently with all of the legislative changes or anything that may change in policy with us internally, we can update that document more frequently. So um, I do understand what you're asking for. And if you don't mind, I think the comprehensive document will go beyond just the manual and just a handbook to give, to give the procedural guidelines of um, maybe let's talk about initial evaluations or child find. We do explain all of that, but we also provide all of their legal rights as referred to by Ms. Rowe. So I think this document is much more comprehensive and does kind of both, right? Handbook manual, but also that policies and procedures for compliance. Committee I, members, are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to move this policy to first reader? So move, Thomas. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Is there any discussion? Ms. Rowe. Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Um, Causey. So I, I wanted to ask it, if there's a time frame uh, within which the uh, more comprehensive document um, that Dr. Perandozzi referenced is going to be finished um, because there's additional implementation and timeline guidance uh, related to um, that in the public works recommendation that's on page 50, or I guess it's numbered page 48. So if I may, Ms. Rowe, I yes, we go ahead. This is um, probably three quarters, if not more, actually, of the way completed. And we did, we've did. we also recently added all of the changes and amendments that are required through compliance from being a system in corrective action. So we have included all of those areas that were identified by MSDE. So we are updating that and I am submitting that to MSDE this week for to meet some of their compliance measures with that document i continue to refer to it as draft because we would like to enhance that document throughout and make it a fluid document that we can add standard operating procedures add flow charts for folks who really want to look at that and say like child find we've defined the process of child find what it takes to be identified evaluated and an initial iep and then, but what I'd like to do, because I believe it's currently user friendly, as well as well received by staff, is to have a flow chart that can walk folks through that that visual, that picture. Maybe it's my special ed background. I wanna, I want that visual to go with everything that is narr is written or a narrative format. So we want to be able to add those things continually into that document until it is complete and comprehensive enough to where we believe we've covered everything for all of our end users. So I can tell you, um, a, it still must be approved and reviewed by Dr. McComas and leadership. And as soon as that occurs, we may then be able to um, bring that forward at, for review or use, actually. Thank you, Ms. Perindosi. I do appreciate all the work you're doing on this document. I have felt that something like that has been needed for some time. I just didn't really know what to call it. Um, Ms. Clark, could you continue with um, the role to send this policy to first reader? 
Yes, Ms. Clausey. Abstain. Dr. Haver. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack. Abstain since I stepped away. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Thank you. Okay, the motion carries. Um, Ms. Howie, which policy would you like to do next? And I believe the committee should. Was there a second one you had that you wanted to do next or should are, are we moving back? Several, uh, Ms. Rowe. So I'd ask that um, Dr. Boswell McComas and her staff be ex if they could be excused, please. And yes. I apologize, um, Ms. Ferguson. I didn't realize you were still on. I'd ask that Ms. Ferguson be excused as well. Yes, she may be excused. Thank you. So members, uh, new members of the committee, welcome. Um, the open secret is that PRC is the most fun you could have in a <laughs> committee meeting. Um, I do have for um, the committee's consideration unfinished business AT230, which is new board member orientation, 8364, financial disclosure statements and 8500, which is board self-evaluation. Those were all brought from previous meetings. Um, and the ones that I have for uh, new business are policy 8501 evaluation and the corrective action plan for the Office of the Inspector General. Um, I would respectfully recommend that um, the corrective action plan be uh, discussed at this time and the other policies uh, depending on the amount of time that the committee has uh, can be brought either after I finish the corrective action plan or um, we'll dribble them out in future meetings. So what's the committee's pleasure? Committee members, does, does everyone have the ability to stay till seven? Ms. Rowe? I yes. do not. Sorry. I do not. Okay. I'm, I move to schedule a special meeting to discuss the remainder of the items on tonight's agenda. Um, do, do we have time to discuss the corrective action plan? Well, no, we'll do that. I just want to ascertain how much time, like how, how, how late can everyone stay? I don't have a hard stop time. Mr. Thomas, do you have a hard stop time? Can some, can the rest of you put in chat your hard stop time? If you have one. Okay, so 6.30. All right, 6.30 looks like, oh, 6, okay. Ms. Howie, if Ms. Hen leaves, do we still have a quorum? Of yes. The committee? I believe we do. Okay, so let's go until 6.30, and the remainder that we do not accomplish by 6.30, Ms. Howie and I will get together and figure out when those will be done, or if we will require an additional meeting to accomplish those. It may be that we put an additional meeting in a bit further down the road as things get pushed from one meeting to another. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of work to do and the magnet policy did take a significant amount of time, but the work takes the time it takes and if the committee members are willing to dedicate that time, I'm willing to have as many meetings as it takes to do the work. But I do need feedback from committee members about their schedules, etc. So, um, Ms. Howie, you may begin on the corrective action plan at your Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, just by way of overview, I didn't uh, get to uh, speak to this uh, with uh, respect to your other policies, policies in the 8000 series. Members of the committee, particularly new members of the committee uh, and for former members of the committee or continuing members, I apologize if this is repetitive. Members, new members of the committee, you have nine policy series and they are numbered from the 0100 series through the 8000 series. So 0100 being basic board commitments, the 1000 series being community, 2000 administration, 3000 being non-instructional services, 4000 being uh, personnel, 5000 students, 6000 curriculum, 7000 new construction. And in all of those policy series, as we discussed, kind of um, in discussing these policies uh, or earlier this afternoon, what you have are the board's vision, the board's goals of where you want the school system to go. 
the what and the why. And in the superintendent's rules, as we discussed, you have the how. However, the 8000 series stands apart in that they are your internal policies, your internal procedures or bylaws, if you will. So they sort of are your own rules. And that's why they read a little bit differently. So there is one 8000 series policy that is addressed in the corrective action plan, but I just wanted to make sure that distinction was clear as you, uh, you hear about both the 3000 series and the 8000 series policies. So as you're aware, uh, members of the board, there is a corrective action plan that was presented to the office of the Inspector General for Education. And in that corrective action plan, what the board indicated was that it would, through the PRC, review the policy 3000 series. Now, when you're talking about the policy 3000 series, there are actually 33 policies in the series. And in addition to having policy series numbers, as I said, 0, 100 through um, the 7000 series, you also have within many of your policy series sub series. So within the 3000 series, sub series 3200 is purchasing, 3300 food services, 3400 transportation, 3500 physical plant, 3600 fees. 3,700 safety and security and 3,800 is planning. So obviously not th those other series do not address the corrective action plan or the issues identified the, by the Office of the Inspector General. So my recommendation, first of all, is that when looking at revising or amending parts of the 30 of the 3000 series, you can find and kind of have a laser focus on the 3200 series, which is purchasing. Within the 3200 series, and there are eight policies within the 3200 series, there are six that are specifically um, addressing the purchasing issues we believe were identified by the Office of the Inspector General. So we, and it's in your, uh, in the memo that was provided to you, are specifically recommending that policy 3200, 3209, 3210, 3215, 3230, and 3231 be the policies reviewed in compliance with the Office of the Inspector General Corrective Action Plan because those all address procurement issues. With respect to those policies, what we have done is provided to you language that tracks with section 5112 of the education article. And also in the section on the legal references, we've included the state finance and procurement article, as well as a reference to uh, the attendant regulation from the state finance and procurement article. If you think of section 5112 kind of as a Russian nesting doll, section 5112 references the state finance and procurement article. The state finance and procurement article references COMAR and that's and in the state finance and procurement article is where SPA procurements are defined and defined as $50,000. So we recommend changing uh, or at least tracking to 5112, not indicating that it's 50,000 because if state finance and procurement changes, then that will also change your requirement. And the requirement for 50,000 was itself changed a few years ago up from 25,000. Uh, with respect to policy 8350, again, your internal policy, that has to do with council. And currently before the General Assembly, Senate Bill 55 um, is making its way through committee. That Senate bill would amend section 4104 of the education article concerning council. And it would take out those four words that say, except in Baltimore County. So rather than present to you suggested changes for 8350 at this meeting, we discussed them previously, uh, staff is recommending that we wait until the end of the session, and we're now at day 60 of the session, but we wait until the end of the session, depending upon the changes to a to Senate Bill 55, if that actually happens, we'll bring forward 
for the committee's consideration changes to 8350, which would have been presented anyway. So that is in um, in brief, and it's very hard for lawyers to be in brief. That is in brief um, uh, the presentation concerning a corrective action plan. I'm available to answer questions. Committee members, are there questions? I think you explain explain things very well. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Chair Rowe. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, that makes a great deal of sense in, in very few words. Really appreciate that and the memo is great. Um, I did have a question in the um, November meeting of the audit, Ford's audit committee, um, there was a follow up to the UHY report and in it there is um, observation number no. There's a couple observations in here. Um, and in that report, they indicate that there was a um, observation that the procurement operating procedures have not been updated in three years and that there was a um, timeline of having that done in December. But if the board is trying to do its work in the um, OIGE corrective action plan, uh, would it make sense that those are done sooner? Because uh, one of the points is that the board would be trained and that we would operate the board operating procedures, but if the procurement office's procedures are not updated, that, that would be problematic. So, so I don't know where the... And, and I'm not sure, uh, Ms. Causey, where the amendment and changes to the procedures are. But if you think of an inverted pyramid, flip the pyramid. So the pyramid at the top of the pyramid in uh, BCPS land and the board and board land would be the the board's policies as far as what we're guided by. And from those policies come the superintendent's rules. And from those rules come the operating procedures for each office. I'm not aware of the, what is going on now with the uh, operating procedures in the Office of Purchasing. I can certainly find out, uh, but at, but if you again track the the uh, the pyramid, any procedure would have to be consistent with the rule. Any rule would have to be consistent with the policy. Oh, I, I understand, but there's multiple deliverables for the board to come through and I believe the deadline was November but if there's pieces of that that rely on other offices or departments um, I just want it to have that looked at sooner rather than later so I appreciate and I'm not aware I will find out uh, whether or not there's anything in the boards acting on these six policies that would otherwise delay what the office of purchasing is doing I don't think so but I will find out. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cosby. I had a couple of questions, Ms. Howie. Sure. Um, we had the attorney's memo attached to the OIGE corrective action plan, mm -hmm. and it's unclear to me that we keep referencing state procurement law, but the attorney's memo said that there was the court case that state procurement law does not apply to school systems. Chesapeake Charter, so, yes ma'am. So if that's true, why do we keep referencing state procurement laws? And has this, does the school system have policies in which we've voluntarily bound ourselves to some, if not all of those? And if you could expound on that, because I'm sure there's a reason I'm confused. And I don't think that you're confused, ma'am. Uh, the school system can determine what it wants to follow, but then it's required to do so. So MBE, for example, um, we have voluntarily decided we're going to follow the state MBE requirements. Uh, that is not, but again, we're not subject to it. The Chesapeake Charter case, 
um, out of Anne Arundel County, uh, which went to the Court of Appeals, I believe, did indicate that local boards of education are not subject to the state finance and procurement article, they're subject to 5112. But if we talk about this discrete issue, 5112 refers to four small procurements, the state finance and procurement article. Again, think about those Russian nesting dolls. So within 5112, even though it does not give a specific amount, it does reference the state finance and procurement article, I think 13109, which in and of itself has an amount. So while we may not be subject to all of the procurement practices that state that units of state government are subject uh, to which they are subject, there are elements of the state finance and procurement article that are referenced in 5112. Okay, I think I understand that. Do we have articulated in our policies and when we review these policies, are we going to articulate the different aspects of the state procurement article that we are voluntarily binding ourselves to? Or how would I know what we voluntarily bound ourselves to, I guess is my question. Like, where does that exist? Is it throughout all of our policies? Is there some other document? So again, in order to track what is in 5112, the language and the adjustment that uh, staff is recommending would simply be to reference as an affirmative statement that the board will follow and adhere to the requirements of 5112. So to the extent there are references or there is a reference in 5112 to 13109 of the state procurement article, then uh, the, the board is affirmatively stating that it will follow those requirements. So would then the specifics of those requirements be included in board orientation training? It can be. Okay. Are there any other questions from committee members? Ms. Howie, how, how are you recommending that we proceed on this? So um, as set forth in the memo that you have three policies that come forward in March and that will be 3200, 3209, 3210. So the formal um, analyses can be presented for all three of those at that time. And then in May, you'll have another three. So if there is more discussion that the committee wishes to have and for our new members of the committee, as you see, um, often when discussions take place, they take a little bit more time than staff anticipate. So rather than having six purchasing policies at once, have at least uh, half of them and divide them that way. That's the recommendation. Okay. Um, committee members, is there any objection to having staff proceed in that manner? I do not have any. Okay. Hearing none, Ms. Howie, please um, proceed with that. And so we're coming up on our time here. Committee members, does anyone object to um, adjourning this meeting? And Ms. Howie and I will discuss a separate date to either work the rest of these items into the next meeting agenda but we will definitely have to have an additional meeting at some point in time. Um, no objections? Okay. So the next uh, meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for March 14th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. And because there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone and happy Valentine's Day and I hope you all enjoy your evenings. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Good job, Christian. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.